Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering UiPath Forward Americas 2019. Brought to you by UiPath. Welcome back to the Bellagio in Las Vegas, everybody. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. My name is Dave Vellante, day one of UiPath. UiPath Forward 3, uh, hashtag UiPath Forward. Elena Christopher is here, she's a Senior Vice President at HFS Research, and, I, and Elena, I'm going to recruit you to be my co-host here. Co-host! On this, this power panel. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gene Younger's here, uh, CUBE alum, VP of Six Sigma, Six Sigma Leader at Security Benefit, great to see you again. Thank and Amy Chandler, who's the Assistant Vice President and Director of Internal Controls, also from Security Benefit. Hello. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thank you. All right, Elena, let's, let's start off with you. Uh, you follow this market, you have for some time, uh, you know, HSFS is sort of um, anointed as formulating, you know, this marketplace. We like this to think of ourselves right? as the voice, early on. the voice of the automation so industry. So, what are you seeing? I mean, process automation's been around forever. RPA is hot, recent trend, but what are you seeing in the last year or two? What are the big trends and rip currents that you see in the marketplace? I mean, I think one of the big trends that's out there, I mean, RPA has come onto the scene. I like how you phrase it, Dave, because you refer to it as, um, uh, rightly so, automation is not new, and so we sort of say the big question out there is, is RPA just flavor of the month? RPA is definitely not, and I come from a firm, we put out a blog earlier this year called RPA is Dead, Long Live Automation, and that's because when we look at RPA, and when we think about, um, when we think about what its impact is in the marketplace, to us, the whole point of automation in any form, regardless of whether it's RPA, whether it be good old old school BPM, uh, whatever it may be, its mission is to drive transformation. And so the HFS perspective and what all of our research shows and sort of justifies that um, the goal is, what everyone is striving towards, is to get to that transformation. And so the reason we put out that piece, the RPA is dead, long live integrated automation platforms, is to make the point that if you're not, because what does RPA allow? It affords an opportunity for change to drive transformation. So if you are not actually looking at your processes within your company and taking this opportunity to say, what can I change? What processes are just bad and we've been doing them, I'm not even sure why for so long. Uh, what can we transform? What can we optimize? Uh, what can we invent? If you're not taking that opportunity as an enterprise to truly embrace the change and move towards transformation, that's a missed opportunity. So I always say, RPA, you can kind of couch it as one of many technologies, but what RPA has really done for the marketplace today, it's given business users the and business leaders the realization that they can have a role in their own transformation. And that's one of the reasons why it's actually become very important. But a single tool in its own right will never be the holistic answer. So Jane, Elena's bringing up a point about transformation. We, we Stu Binham and I interviewed you last year, and we've played those clips a number of times where you sort of were explaining to us that it didn't make sense before RPA to try to drive Six Sigma into business process. Just couldn't get the return. Right. Now, now you can do it very cheaply. Uh, and, and of course Six Sigma or better is what you, you use for airplane engines, right? right? So now you're bringing that to business process. So you're a year in, how's it going? Are you, what kind of results are you seeing? Is it, is it meeting your expectations? It's been wonderful. It has been the best, it's been probably the most fun I've had in the last 15 years of work. I have enjoyed, partly because I get to work with this great person <laughs> here, um, and she's my COE and helps stand up the whole um, RPA solution, but you know, we have gone from finance into investment operations, into operations. You know, we've got one sitting right now that we're going to be looking at statements that it's going to be 14,000 hours out of both time out as well as staff hours saved. And it's going to touch our customer directly that they're not going to get a bad statement anymore. And so, you know, it has just been an incredible journey for us over the past year. It really has. And so, okay, Amy, your role is, you're the hardcore practitioner here, right? So you, That's right. You run the COE. Um, <laughs> tell us more about your role. And, and I'm really interested in how you're bringing it out, RPA, to the organization. Is that led by your team, or is it kind of this top-down approach, or? Yeah, um, this last year we spent a lot of time trying to educate um, the lower levels and go from a bottom up perspective. Um, pretty much we implemented our infrastructure. Um, we 
had a nice solid change management process, we built in logical access, we built in good processes around that so that we'd be able to scale easily over, the over this last year. So, which kind of sets us up for next year and everything that we want to accomplish then. So, Lena, we were talking earlier on theCUBE about you know, RPA in many ways is, I call it cleaning up the crime scene. <laughs> where stuff is kind of really sort of, sort of a mess and huge opportunities to, to improve. So my question to you is, it seems like RPA is in, in some regards successful because you can drop it into existing processes, you're not changing things, but in a way, there's concerns that, oh well, I'm just kind of paving the cow path. So how much process reinvention should have to occur in order to take advantage of RPA? So, and I love that you use that phrase, paving the, paving the cow path. Um, as a New Englander, as you know, the roads in Boston are in fact paved cow paths. So, it's we know that that can lead to some dodgy roads. And that's part of, and I say it because that's part of what the answer is. Um, because the reinvention, and honestly the optimization has to be part of what the answer is. I said it just a little bit earlier in my comments, you're missing an opportunity with RPA and broader automation if you don't take that step to actually look at your processes and figure out if there, there's, I mean just essentially, dead wood that you need to get rid of, things that need to be improved. One of the sort of the guidelines, because not all processes are created equal, because you don't want to spend the time and effort, and you guys should chime in right. unless, you don't want to spend the time and effort to optimize a process if it's not critical to your business, if you're not going to get lift from it or from some ROI. It's a bit of a continuum. So one of the things that I always encourage enterprises to think about is this idea of, well what's the, obviously, what business process Problem are you trying to solve? But as you're going through the process optimization, what kind of user experience do you want out of this? And your users, by the way, they don't, it tends, you tend to think of your user as, it could be your end customer, it could be your employee, it could even be your partner. But trying to figure out what the experience is that you actually want to have, and then you can actually then look at the process and figure out, do we need to do something different? Do we need to do something um, completely new to actually optimize that, and then again line it with what you're trying to solve and what kind of lift you want to get from it. Um, but I'd love to, I mean, popping over to you guys, you live and breathe this, right? And so I know, I think you have a slightly different opinion than me, but. We do live and breathe it, and um, every process we look at, we take the consideration, but you've also got to, you have a continuum, right? If it's a simple process and we can put it up very quickly, we do, I mean, it's, but we've also got ones where one process will come into us, and a perfect example is our rate, rate, rate changes. changes. Mm -hmm. It came in and there was, um, one process at the very end and they ended up, do, we did a wing to wing of the whole thing, followed the data all the way back through the process and I think it hit, what, seven or eight yeah. different areas, areas of the business. Mm -hmm. And once we got done with that, whole wing to wing to see what we could optimize. It turned into, what, 60? Yeah, 60 plus, yeah. 60, 60 plus what? Uh, bot, bot processes. Bot processes from yes. one entry. Yeah. And so, right now we've got 189 to 200 processes in the backlog, and so if you take that and exponentially increase it, we know that there's probably actually 1,000 to 2,000 more processes at minimum that we can hit yeah. for the company, and, and we need to look at those. Yeah, and I will say the, the wing to wing approach is very important because you're following the data as it's moving along. So if you don't do that, if you only focus on a small little piece of it, you don't know what's happening to the data before it gets to you and you don't know what is, what's going to happen to it when it leaves you. So you really do have to take that wing to wing approach. So your internal controls is mm -hmm. in your title. Yeah. So <laughs> you're basically talking about scale. Mm -hmm. It's a big theme here mm -hmm. at UiPath. And with these days things scale really fast and mm -hmm boo-boos can happen really fast. So mm -hmm. how are you ensuring you know, that the edicts of the organization are met, whether it's security, compliance, mm -hmm. governance, is that part of your role? Yeah, we've actually um, kept internal audit and internal controls, and in fact, our external auditors, EY, we've kept them all at the table when we've gone through processes, when we've built out our change management process, our logical access, when we built our whole process from beginning to end. They kind of sat at the table with us and kind of went over everything to make sure that we were hitting all the controls that we needed to do. And actually, I'd like to piggyback on that mm -hmm. comment because just that includes of the various roles 
that's what, what we found as an emerging best practice in, in all of our research and all of the qualitative conversations that we have with enterprises and service providers is because if you do things, I mean it applies on multiple levels, because if you do things in a silo, you'll have siloed impact. If you bring the appropriate constituents to the table, you're going to understand their perspective, but it's going to have broader reach. So it helps alleviate the silos, but it also supports the point that you just made, Amy, about looking at the processes end to end, right. because you've got the mm -hmm. necessary constituents involved, so you know the context, and then mm -hmm. um, I believe, I mean, I think you guys shared this with me, that uh, particularly when audits involved, yep. they actually, you're perhaps helping cultivate an understanding of how even their processes can improve as well. Right. Mm -hmm. That is true, and yeah. from an overall standpoint with um, controls, I think a lot, of, a lot of people don't realize that a huge benefit is your controls, because if you're automating your controls, you know, from an internal standpoint, you're not going to have to test as much from, you know, just a, an associate, a process owner, um, paying attention to their process, to the internal auditors, they're not going to have to test as much either, and then your external auditors, which that's revenue. I mean, that's You savings. lower your auditing yeah. bill? Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll yes. see, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's always the hope. I'll tell you why. <laughs> yeah. So, I got to ask you, so like, this year, a year in, over a little over a year in, right? So if you had a, I don't know if you golf, but if, you know, mulligan in golf, if you had a mulligan, like a do-over, what would you do over? The first process we put in place, at okay. least for me, it, it um, breaks a lot. And uh, we did it because at the time we were going through decoupling and trying to just get something up to make sure that what we stood up was going to work and everything. And so we kind of slammed it in and um, we pay for that every quarter, because <laughs> and so actually it's on our list to redo. Yeah. We automated a bad process. Yeah, we so automated we, a bad process. So, really point. Yeah. Point. so we pay for it in maintenance every right. yeah every quarter we pay for it, because it, it breaks inevitably. Yes. So, okay, so what has to happen? You have to reinvent the process to Elena's? Yes, we're, you know, we're, we relied on a, a process that somebody else had put in place, and in looking at it, it was kind of a, um, up and down and through the hoop and around this way to get what they needed and you know, there's much easier ways to get the data now and that's what we're doing. In fact, we've built our own, we call it a bot mart. That's where all our data goes. They won't let us touch the other data marts and so forth, so they created us a, a bot mart and anything that we need data for, they dump in there for us and then that's where our bot can hit and our bot can hit it at any time of the day or night when we need the data. Mm, and so it's worked session. out really, it's worked out really well for us. And so that kind of the bot mark kind of came out of that, yeah. that mm -hmm. project of you know, there's got to be a better way. How can we do this better instead of relying on these systems that change and upgrade and then we run the bot and it's working one day and the next day somebody has gone in and tweaked something. And when all I really need out of that system is data. That's all yeah. I need. I don't need you know, a report. I don't need anything like that because the reports change and they get messed up. I just want the raw data, and so that's what we're starting to do. How do you ensure that the data is synchronized with your other marts and warehouses? And is that a problem? No. Not yet. Yes. No, no, not, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering, because I was thinking the exact same question, Dave, because on one hand, it's a nice, I think, step from a governance standpoint. You have what you need perhaps IT or whomever your, your data mm -hmm. curators are, they're not going to have a heart attack that you're touching stuff right. that they don't want you to, right. but then there is that potential for synchronization issues, because that whole concept of golden source implies one copy, if you will. Well, and it is, it's all coming through. We have a central data repository that the data is going to come through and it's yeah. all sitting there and then it'll move over. And you know, to me, what, what I most worry about, like I mentioned on the statement ones, okay, I get my data in, is is it the same data that got used to create those statements? Yeah. And as we're doing the testing and as we're looking at um, going live, that's one of our huge test cases. We need to understand what time that data comes in, when will it be into our bot mart, so when can I run those bots? You know, because they're all going to be unattended on those, and so, you know, the timing is critical, and so that's why I said not yet. <laughs> But, but you want to know what? We can build a bot to do that compare of the data for us. <laughs> right, so we I can ensure. That yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I saw a stat the other day, I don't know where it was on Twitter, or maybe it was your data, that more money by, I don't know, whatever, 2023 is going to be spent on chat bots than mobile development. Mm -hmm. I can imagine, is, yes. Are you guys, mm -hmm. what, yes. what are you doing with chat bots and how are you using them? And, 
Do you want to answer that you, one? You, you want go me ahead. to? You go ahead. Okay. So part of the reason I'm so in, <laughs> enthralled by the chatbot or personal assistant or anything is because the unattended robots that we have. We have problems making sure that people are doing what they're supposed to be doing in prep. We have some in finance. And you know, finance you have a very fine line of what you can automate and what you, what you need the user to still understand what they're doing, right? And so we felt like we had a really good you know, combination of that. But in some instances they forget to do things, so things aren't there, we get the phone call, the bot broke, right? So part of the thing I'd like to do is I'd like to move that back to an unattended bot, and I'm going to put a chat bot in front of it, and then all they have to do is type in run my bot, and it'll come up if they have more than one bot, it'll say which one do you want to run, they'll click it, and it'll go. Instead of having to go out on their machine, figure out where to go, figure out which button to do, and in the chat I can also send them a little message, did you run your other reports, did you do this, you know, so I can use it for the, end user to make that experience for them better. And plus, we've got a lot of IT, we've got a lot of um, HR stuff that can fold into that, and then RPA will be in behind it, um, kind of the engine on a lot of it. Yeah. So you, you've child-proofed the bot. The exactly, point. there you go, exactly. there exactly. you go. And it also provides a, mean, a means to be able to answer those commonly asked questions for like HR, for example. You know, how much vacation time do I have? When can I change my benefits? Examples of those that they answer like frequently every day. So it gives, you know, that provides another avenue for um, utilization of the chatbot. And if I may, Dave, it yeah, sort please. of it supports a concept that I know we were talking about yesterday. We call it HFS, it's our AAA trifecta, but it's just taking the baseline of automation, it intersects with components of AI, and then potentially with uh, analytics. This is starting to touch on some of the opportunities to look at other technologies. You say chatbots. Mm -hmm. At HFS, we don't use the term chatbot just because we like to focus and emphasize the cognitive mm -hmm. capability, if you will. Um, but in any case, you guys essentially are saying, well, RPA is doing great for what we're using RPA for, but we need a little bit of extension of functionality, so we're layering in the chatbot or cognitive yes. assistant. So it's a nice example of some of that extension of really seeing how it's, I always call it, it's also the power of and, if you yeah. will, mm -hmm. how you're going to layer these things in to get what you need out of it, what best solves your business problems. It's just a very practical approach, I think. So, Lena, a uh, guy uh, has a session tomorrow on predictions, so we're going to end with some predictions. So our okay. RPA is dead. Uh, will, it, uh -huh. will it be resuscitated? What's the, what's the future uh, of RPA look like? Will it live up to the hype? I mean, so many initiatives in our industry haven't. I always criticize enterprise data warehousing and ETL and Hadoop and big data as not living up to the hype. Will RPA? It's got a hell of a lot of hype to live up to, I'll tell you that. So, I mean, back to some of our causality about why we even said it's dead. As a discrete software category, RPA is clearly not dead at all, but unless it's helping to drive forward with transformation, and even some of the strategies that these fine ladies from Security Benefit are utilizing, which is layering in additional technology, that's part of the path there. But honestly, the biggest challenge that you have to go through to get there is, and cannot be underestimated, is the change that your organization has to go through. Because think about it, if we look at the grand big vision of where RPA and broader intelligent automation takes us, the concept of creating a hybrid workforce, right? So what's a hybrid workforce? Is literally our humans complemented by digital workers. So that, it still sounds like science fiction. To think that any enterprise could try and achieve some version of that, and that it would be A, fast, or B, not take a lot of change management, is absolutely ludicrous. So it's just a very practical approach to be eyes wide open, recognize that you're solving problems, but you have to want to drive change. So to me, and sort of the HFS perspective, continues to be that if RPA is not going to die a, a terrible death, it needs to really support that vision of transformation. And I mean, honestly, we're here at a UI path event. They had many announcements today that they're doing a couple of things, supporting core functionality of RPA, literally adding in process discovery and mining capabilities, adding in analytics so that to help enterprises actually track what your benefit yes. is. These are very practical cases that help RPA live another day, but they're also extending functionality, adding in like their whole announcement around AI fabric, um, adding in some of the cognitive capability to extend the functionality. And so prediction wise, RPA as we know it three years from now is not going to look like RPA at all.
well. I, I'm not going to call it AI, but it's going to become a hybrid, and it's honestly going to look a lot like that AAA trifecta I mentioned. Well, and, mm -hmm. and UiPath and I presume other suppliers as well are expanding their markets. You know, reaching. You know, you hear about citizens developers and you know, 100% of the workforce. Obviously you guys are excited, and yeah. you see a, a long runway for, yeah, for RPA. Do. I'll give you the last word. It's been a wonderful journey thus far. After this morning's event where they showed us everything, I saw a sneak peek yesterday during the cab, and I had a list of things I wanted to talk to her about already when I came out of there, and then she saw more of them today, and we, I've got a, pocket full of notes of stuff that we're going to take back and do. I, I really truly believe this is a future and we can do so much. You know, Six Sigma has kind of gotten a rebirth. Um, you go in and look at your processes and we can get those to perfect. I mean, it, that's what's so cool. It is so cool that you can actually tell somebody, I can do something perfect for you. And how many people get to do that? <laughs> it's back to, back to the user experience, right? Yeah. Which is, we can make this wildly functional yeah. to meet the need. Right, right, right. right. And I don't think it's RPA is the end all solution. I think it's just a great tool to add to your toolkit and utilize moving forward. Great. All right, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks ladies for coming on. It was a great segment. Really appreciate Thanks. your time. Thank you. Thank you, right, thank thank you, you for ladies. watching everybody. This is Dave Vellante with theCUBE. We'll be right back from UiPath Forward 3 from Las Vegas right after this short break.